Hello and welcome to uh, another webinar on behavioral economics and its applications in business. Uh, today we're going to talk with uh, Torben Emmeling, uh, and I'll introduce Torben in just a second. Um, in the past webinars, you had the chance to uh, see and ask questions to uh, uh, Sam Tatum, the Behavioral Strategy Director at uh, Ogilvy Consulting, to Oliver Simcoe, uh, who is uh, the founder of a gamification agency. And uh, we talked about uh, um, what behavioral economics and gamification have in common. So today we're going to speak about strategy and how all the amazing insights from uh, behavioral science can um, inspire and, uh, and affect how you go about your strategy process. So I would like to welcome Torben Emmeling. Uh, Torben, welcome. Hello. Pleasure to be here. Torben is, uh, is the founder of Affective Advisory. Uh, Torben is uh, a seasoned behavioral economist, behavioral scientist, uh, who a couple of years ago founded the, the company ever since they've worked. And I'm, I'm hoping you'll tell us more about the, the work you've done with your clients. But I know that you've worked with the, both the government, uh, the NGO sector, and the business sector. Uh, your projects revolve around uh, strategic decision making strategy, but also you do projects uh, linked to consumer behavior or, or citizen behavior. Um, as far as I know, you are the founding member of GAPS, uh, and I'll ask you about the GAPS a little bit later on. And uh, you also invented the Drive framework, which I'm also going to ask you about. So, uh, <laughs> Dorben, once again, uh, welcome. And uh, tell us a few words about what you do at Effective Advisory. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Matei, for this kind introduction and for the invitation to be here and speak to all of you around the world today, which is absolutely exciting and fascinating to see so many of you being here, sharing the passion for behavioral science and especially the passion for behavioral science and strategy. So about myself, as, as you correctly said, I'm the founder and managing partner of Effective Advisory. We're a specialized and fully professional the qualified team of behavioral scientists working with some leading private and public organizations on the application of behavioral science and practice. And as such, we help governments, um, private organizations, all sorts of industries, NGOs, and uh, initiatives around the world to yeah, make better decisions, create better strategies, um, create better and more effective public policies, and ultimately um, support people in being the best version of themselves. Meaning we're looking into the vast research that behavioral science has in stock and what insights we can take from this and apply in practice. And as such, I was really, really uh, happy and uh, excited uh, to, to accept this in the invitation to talk to you today about the topic of behavioral insights for improving strategy processes. Um, it's a topic that's really close to my heart and also very close to the work that we do at Effective, as I said. And it circles a lot around what we could do as decision makers um, to help other people in their work, being it in private or public organizations, being it circled around products, services, being it also around helping citizens or just, yeah, helping us in society to to deliver good and uh yeah we put together around 30 to 40 minutes of uh good current timely content from behavioral science and uh we would like to take you on a as we call it scientific safari to discover some of them and how they could be applied in your environment and as we said uh, feel free to ask questions I'm not saying we know everything, but I'm sure we are a bunch of uh, smart people in this room and also online right now. Um, Mate certainly is, various other people who attend are. And uh, so I'm sure the, the wisdom of the crowd will do the magic to answer most of the questions we have today. So thanks very much for the invitation again. Well, it's, it's a great pleasure. Um, I mean, we've had so many opportunities to, to, to speak together and uh, it has always been a fascinating discussion. And I have a couple of questions for you before we jump onto your presentation. But before that, please let us know where are you connecting from? Um, of course, if you have any troubles hearing or seeing us, let us know. 
of course, but let us also know where you're connecting from, how familiar are you with, uh, with behavioral economics. Um, so, Thurban, what was your path to behavioral economics? I, I suppose that wasn't the plan from when, when you finished primary school or secondary school. Uh, probably you discovered <laughs> it somewhere along the way, didn't you? Yeah, in hindsight, with hindsight bias, I would say definitely I was. Um, for sure I was not. No, I'm, uh, I've am i always had a keen interest in understanding people's decision making. Um, I did an undergrad in, in economics, quantitative economics, finance, and I uh, took any course I could in social psychology on the side to add this, this understanding of how people take decisions and how we can go beyond the traditional economic model, something I want to talk about in, in today's lecture. And that has taken me to pick up the now famous books from the famous authors in the field, including Kahneman, Tversky, and, and others, and to redevelop a, a passion for this field, which after a first master's in, in business strategy, and I sort of followed up on in, in London at the London School of Economics with an executive degree in, in uh, behavioral science and in the foundation of effective advisory in 2017. And since then, we've been conducting research, running projects, uh, developing insights ourselves, as well as collecting insights from this, as I said, great history of 40 years behavioral science research. And yeah, apply this in practice. And it's been a great journey. It's been a fascinating uh, development, being part of the, the growth of the field, as well as observing it. And um, Really happy to be here and be part of this this wonderful growing community. Well, um, hopefully, also this this webinar will bring some people closer to to what what behavioral economics actually is actually about and how especially it can be used in business. Because I mean, we've spoken so many times that uh, you know the, the the main problem is that there's not enough focus on the business applications. And uh, that's what we're trying to change also with, with this webinar. Um, Torben, you created or invented the DRY framework. What is the DRY mm -hmm. framework and how, how can it be used? How, how can people watching this webinar use your framework to apply BE in business? The DRY framework is um, a process for bringing behavioral insights into strategy and public policy. It has been developed with some of the leading thinkers and practitioners in this field, both academic and practitioners. And it's been the result of a journey of around two to three years of working with behavioral insights in practice. It was our attempt, and I'd say in hindsight, it was is a really good attempt. It's a working attempt. It's, it's something that has been proven in a lot of projects to connect business processes, business lingo with behavioral insights. And it's it's nothing more and nothing less than a guided step-by-step -step process along five stages, starting with D for uh, define, R for research of behaviors and contexts, I for identification of behavioral interventions, solutions, nudges, V for validation, really important, the evidence-based approach of, of making sure the, the solutions you develop also work in practice, can be proven, can be scientifically proven to work, and then E, the scaling up and execution basically of of the developed insights in practice so it's a five step best of in my opinion or in our opinion in the opinion of the developers how one can best bring behavioral insights and a behavioral thinking a behavioral informed approach to business and public policy problems around the world awesome um Durbin, um one last question before we jump on your presentation what are you going to talk about <laughs> what are we going to talk about? If I would know, no, I I know it's uh, it's 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 as I said, it's a bit of a, a safari. It's a, it's it's a journey along some of the most important, most recent, and most applicable insights from behavioral science. Over the past week, um, my team and I have sort of dived into the the behavioral science literature, the behavioral science experiment, and collected some insights that we believe every decision maker, every strategist should know in today's world about the way their own thinking, their own judgments are developed, as well as how team decisions are created and how team decisions can be improved 
by respecting or following a couple of very simple principles. So what we're going to talk about is a collection of scientific insights, a lot of really cool, really thought-provoking results from, uh, from research in academia and practice, and some collections, some simple takeaways, five, six, seven steps to apply in practice in the meetings tonight, tomorrow morning, in the following week, or hopefully along the whole a whole life cycle. Okay, so um, tune in, listen up, and uh, I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions um, throughout uh, Torben's presentation. So uh, please don't write the questions in the chat window because they might get lost. Instead, please sign in here, go to pigeonhole.at, enter the passcode Torben, and uh, this is uh, um, uh, an app for, for asking questions in, in conferences and in webinars. So um, please use Pigeonhole to ask your questions. And after Torben is done, we'll get back to your questions and uh, we'll go to every single one of them and Torben will do his best to answer them. Um, I'll leave it up for, for one second. Um, Maybe the last thing before um, I let Torben dive right into, into his, uh, his presentation, maybe you've noticed that uh, this webinar was uh, presented as Inside VE, and also the, the colors, the, the visuals were very different. And uh, this is because we're um, launching in two months from now, exactly. Um, we're launching a, a global project which I very much hope will revolutionize the world of behavioral economics. Inside BE will be the place where behavioral economics meets business, all about how to use behavioral economics in business. Case studies from behavioral experts like Torben, like Sam Tatum from last month, like many others throughout the globe who I have been in touch over the past years and they want to share their work, their insight. There will be online courses, guides, uh, eBooks on how to use all these amazing insights in business. But I'll say a few words um, about Inside BE after Torben is done. In the meantime, you can uh, have an eye, uh, have a look at uh, www.insidebe.com. And uh, now I'm hiding in my present, my slide. I'm uh, uh, letting Torben dive right into his presentation. Good luck, Torben. I'll stick around. Um, <laughs> and jump in if I have some um, some questions, I have some doubts about what you're saying and so on. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, wonderful. So behavioral insights for improving your strategy process is the topic. And the agenda for today is pretty easy, pretty simple. We're gonna talk about humans, we're gonna talk about decision-making, and we're gonna talk about strategy. And the context for this is going to be nothing more, nothing less than the world we live in. And of course, there wouldn't be any strategy presentation without a chessboard, without a mountain you need to climb, and of course, without a boat, but we get to this later. So let's kick off by looking at the world we live in and by just throwing around a couple of interesting insights about this world we're in. We live in an age which can be called the information age. People can even argue it can be called the age of influence. It's the period in human history characterized by a shift from industrial production um, to one based on computation, information, and knowledge sharing. Never ever in the world, never ever in the history of this planet has there been more interconnection, more sharing of information, more dependencies. Just last week, one ship blocked a whole canal and some of Europe wasn't able to get the products they were waiting for. We are incredibly connected and we are incredibly overloaded and bombarded with information these days. According to a study by Hilbert and Lopez, humankind shared around 65 exabytes of information already back in 2007. That is... 15 years ago. It is the equivalent of every person on this planet 
sending out contents of six newspapers every day. I want to put this into perspective, a perspective that is more that is most easily explained with looking on your phone or sharing what you see when you watch your phone screens. This is 5 billion searches each day. This is 295 billion emails each day, 500 million tweets each day, 65 billion WhatsApp messages, or four petabytes of Facebook data. Insane amounts of information around us every moment, every day. What is a petabyte? One petabyte is 44,000 4K movies, 1.5 million CD-ROM discs, and since we talk about humans, human decision making, one petabyte is more. Sorry, almost. Sorry, two. Almost our two ti- half of our brain. Now I got it. <laughs> the estimated storage of our brain is 2.5 petabytes. So we are able to just collect and make sense of an informa- of two days of information that is produced every day on this planet. How about the receiving end? Well, of course, this is way too much to be processed, way too much to make sense of, consciously, and even though also unconsciously. We, according to this study by Shina Ingwa, process the information equivalent of 24 newspapers every day unconsciously. Consciously, it's even way less. So what does this tell us, this comparison of senders and receivers? There is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of information out there, which creates a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of uncertainty for every decision makers, for the most simplistic task, like picking the right soft drink for your break, or going to the, to the fridge in home offices like today and picking the right product, the right sweet, the right drink, maybe the right sugar less drink for your break you're having before watching webinars or joining any remote meetings. We say that one could even argue we pass the point where information is helping us make better decisions. We probably are at a point where information is hindering us from making more decisions. So it's not, it's not a question of what more information can we get to make better decisions. It's What sort of information do we need to select from this huge amount of information to make good decisions? And how do we evaluate this information and how do we best put it into a perspective? One example or one study that illustrated this very beautifully, very elegantly was this study, the famous marmalade jar uh, study. For all of you who don't know this, who've not seen this, it's a study where researchers Ingvar, Leper, and others have, in 2002, presented different sets of marmalade jars in an, in an upscale food market. So in one condition, shoppers saw 24 different jars of marmalade. The next day, um, they were only presented six jars of marmalade. As you can see on the top picture here on the top right, a lot of jars versus uh, fewer jars the second day. What did you what do you think happened? Well, in the condition of 24 different jars, 60% of the people stop to try and 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 flavor the 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 new marmalade and are really interested. So a lot of attention is created. In the condition of six jars, only 40% of the people passing this display stop. It gets really interesting when we look at how many people bought the marmalade afterwards. In the condition of 24 jars, only 3% of the people shop. 60% stop, 3% shop. Whereas in the condition of six jars, we have 30% of the people shopping. Amazing. We have a difference, less is more. Or as the the title of this wonderful example was, was called, when choice is demotivating, can one desire too much of a good thing? Certainly you can. It is not so much about how much you present, but how you present it. Framing is all that matters. Just think a while back. Think back ten more than 10 years when we are still calling or messaging each other with a Nokia 
3210 or a Motorola or any other cell phone, who would have thought that spending $999 for a smartphone is a, is a good thing to do? We essentially created a whole new product. I know it's completely, it's, it's, it's revolutionary. It's much more than a phone these days. However, it's also much more from a lifestyle, from a, from a positioning perspective. And it's, much, it's even more so if you present the product not just as a new phone is on stock, you can go and try it out, but in a keynote that is essentially all around the one big thing you got to present. And by putting it into perspective, putting it into the right framing and comparing it with two or three other products next to it, which are slightly less expensive or slightly more expensive. I remember, Matej, you also covered this in one of your, um, in one of your um, Mightworks modules where you talk about decoy effects and the case of framing, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Deco is uh, uh, very well known, especially thanks to Denner Yelly and, uh, and 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 his famous examples of uh, of decoy. Um, basically, as you're saying, it's an amazing example of uh, how uh, an irrelevant option, which is added to the product mix, can steer and and uh, um, influence your decisions in ways. Uh, that you wouldn't you wouldn't expect in in ways much more powerful uh, than increasing or decreasing prices because uh, basically the context is the king um, and I stress out not content but context is the king and as Rory Shadow yes. uh, puts it context is your marketing super weapon. It's that is amazing. I want to pick up on that context and content. Because I would like to show you an example where the content was creating a wonderful context for a different product. Let me move on one slide. This is a study that is called the Dieter's Paradox. A beautiful illustration of how the context and the content actually shapes how people perceive a product. It's about a presentation of a meal, an unhealthy meal that is Put in context uh, with very healthy side dishes, for example, fresh tomatoes, fresh salad, some cucumbers, maybe some pickles and onions. Essentially still another very healthy dish. What happens? We asked, this study has asked people to say, how many calories do you estimate this meal has? And it was divided in two groups, weight conscious individuals, so people that look what they eat and how much calories they, they take in versus people that are slightly less caring about the calorie intake, so the weight in different individuals. So if we just present an unhealthy dish, just a burger, we ask people how many calories do you think this burger has? We get an average of 711 for the weight conscious individuals and 684 for the less, less conscious individuals. And then... This study has shown the exact same meal next to a healthy alternative, stressing the healthiness of tomatoes, salads. What happens is it must be more, yet by the framing, the contextual arrangement, people expect the whole meal, which is more than before, now has less calories. Again, making the point for what Tate just said, context is your super weapon. The way you present your products ultimately influences how people perceive them and what decisions they take for buying the products, using your services, following the policy you're created, everything you do, watch for the right framing. Isn't that amazing? This is, this is a beautiful example. Um, and, and we've seen it time and again in each and every of our projects. We, we mainly work with, with the big corporations, banks, insurance companies, Context matters a lot. And I have a, a, an amazing example from um, one little case study we, we did a couple of years ago. It was a case study for a bank. Long story short, they um, needed to uh, increase conversions of their direct email campaign. And uh, uh, it was all about travel insurance. And um, basically in their original email, uh, one sentence would said that um, after your... Um, year of free travel insurance expires, you will be charged 25 euros per, uh, per year. So it's, 
we obviously where it makes or breaks. This is the, the, the most relevant information, which probably will uh, dissuade so many people from taking up the, the free travel insurance at all. So what we did, uh, I mean, we, we did a lot, of, uh, a lot of changes in the email, which eventually resulted in a, in a threefold increase in conversions. But uh, one of the interventions was reframing this one uh, crucial sentence. So instead of saying, um, after the free uh, year ends, you will be charged 25 euros uh, per year, we said, um, after the first uh, free year ends, you will be charged 25 uh, euros for the next year, so that you're covered for all your trips throughout the year. And suddenly you, you switch the focus from the negative part of things, from the negative uh, negative information, which might dissuade people, and you switch the focus towards the positive side of things. And this is just so powerful. It doesn't cost you anything. And uh, it, 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 it simply has so much impact at so tiny costs. Which is amazing. It's the small things that matter, the small things that have a huge impact. And the small things that often go against traditional economic theory or the idea of rational agents, which was most prominently promoted and popularized by these two great gentlemen, von Neumann and Morgenstern, uh, 1944. The idea that people, it's actually a Nobel Prize theory, the idea that um, we have rational agents maximizing their expected utility. Simply and very elegantly expressed in one simple formula. And everything this theory dictates is that every person on this planet with tons and tons and tons of data perform this calculation, even when carrying out the most simple tasks we run a cost-benefit analysis and determine whether the action is worth pursuing for the best possible outcome or not. And we follow the principles of completeness, transitivity, independence, and continuity. This is beautiful from a mathematical modeling point of view. However, it's not really what happens in practice because instead of following the expected utility curve and modeling it, people are doing all sorts of funny things. I mean, why on the planet does the majority of 3D printing, for example, go into private hands for private leisure? It is fun, of course, but it's not explained purely through the expected utility model and other things around the world. So we've got to make sure that we got to make sure that we not only follow the, the rational models to explain what people are doing but to enhance that thinking and take into account insights, for example, from the behavioral sciences. And to do that, we need to make sure that the traditional picture, the traditional image of the also rational homo economicus is at least in part replaced again with a picture of the homo sapiens. The picture of someone who is by the words of this gentleman, Herbert Simon, boundedly rational. So that is a human being limited in its capacity to think, in its capacity to, to receive and make sense of information, and that is essentially bounded in its time and its, and its power and its willingness to make good decisions, to perform judgments, to create strategies. And not only are we limited, in our ability, we're also limited in our power. You can imagine brain like a muscle. We're getting tired. Concept called eco depletion um, kicks in. We are essentially making mistakes because our brain, like any muscle, is just not strong enough to perform at our best level for 24 hours. Again, we brought a wonderful study illustrating this. This year, is a wonderful illustration, as I said, of a yeah, an example where ego depletion happens even in the most important decisions and the decisions of the highest stakes. What you can see here is a chart where there is 
On the x-axis, the number of cases heard by judges plotted. So between one and roughly 40 cases are heard by the judges every day. And on the y-axis, we see the percentage of favorable judge rulings to grant conditional freedom to um, defendants. So if it's above 50%, it's in favor of the defendant. If it's below 50%, it's less so. What you can see is this graph plotting all the different decisions along the day has a down, three times downward sloping shape, that, which is already pretty, pretty crazy because there is sort of a pattern. It is even more crazy if you look at the reasons for that pattern that was found out. Essentially, after the judges had a breakfast, had a lunch, or an afternoon break, they were fresh. They had energy. They were able to look at the information and they were in better moods to grant conditional freedom to the defendants. So if you just take away one thing of this webinar, make sure that whenever your case is heard in court, it's not just before lunch break or before the afternoon tea. We are essentially limited in the, our ability to make good decisions along the day. And we are not rational economic agents. This you probably know from any information you picked up from behavioral economics, most prominently from these two gentlemen, Kahneman and Tversky, and their all favorite, probably most cited economic article um, on judgments under uncertainty, heuristics and biases. We rely on simple heuristics when we make decisions under uncertainty. And the uncertainty, as we saw in our world today, is incredibly high. And this reliance on heuristics can lead to systematic and predictable judgments errors or as they called it, or we call it today, the biases. So in short, strategic decision-making is about navigating and controlling the influences that, that come from this world and that impact our decision-making, our ability to make good strategic decisions. We are influenced by completely automatic things that we have no control over, and we don't know that we're doing them. So from this introduction to this world we're in and to, these, to the human beings that we are in this world that we are in, we have some good news coming. Because the more we know and the more we are aware of this and the more we can control for these biases and our biased judgment and decision-making and strategy and public policy, the better we can perform as individuals and as teams. So if you are more familiar with behavioral insights or behavioral economics, this has probably been a summary and a good introduction to the topic. Now we jump into like the, the real insights on strategy. What do we know? A very recent study by Newton, Benshop, Reasonbit, and Wilming has looked at what are the top biases in entrepreneurial decision making? And they created a category, particularly for strategic decision making. And the results are striking. For people familiar with behavioral insights, behavioral economics and practice, they are also confirming a lot of what we believe or what we've been working with in the past. Let's go through these biases one by one. The top bias in strategy identified by these two researchers was clearly overconfidence or the tendency to be overly confident in one's own judgment, regardless of the objective accuracy of the judgment itself. So we just believe more in our abilities than we probably should. Number one, bias in strategy. Number two, also all-time favorite, the planning policy the tendency to overestimate the amount of work that can be done in a given time frame. You all know this. Without the last minute, nothing would be finished on time. The third one, status quo bias. No, this study looked at entrepreneurs, so people who have got a higher tendency, a higher willingness, and maybe even a higher ability to change the way the world is, to change the status quo. Even these people rank on number three, the status quo bias, the tendency to prefer the current state of affairs or the state of already made decisions over a potential change. Fourth, 
confirmation bias, the tendency to search for information that supports one's previous beliefs and decisions while dismissing contradicting information. Whenever we look for information, we look for information that suits our previously held ideas and that is in favor of what we already believe to be true. We have a very hard time to consider the opposite and counterfactual. We'll get to this in a second. And last one, which was, I have to say, pretty new for me, the escalation of commitment. In this study, the, the team of researchers found that the tendency to remain committed to past behaviors, um, especially those displayed in public, despite undesirable consequences, is something that is, is really, really key. It's really hard for us to change. It's really hard for us to overcome things that we believe should be gone in that direction. How do you feel about this, Matei? Well, I'm, I'm just thinking that the, the last one probably has to do with the status quo bias uh, to some extent, um, because we usually stick with the, uh, the behaviors, opinions, which we're familiar with, which we're used to performing, and uh, that's in, in sort status quo bias. So I can imagine, and also the, the, the planning fallacy is uh, uh, linked to overconfidence to some extent. So, um, but, but this happens very often that biases and, and heuristics are interconnected and um, yeah. one kind of triggers another one. So, uh, but, but it's, it's really interesting, um, as, especially the last one, as you said, uh, the overconfidence confirmation bias. I might have expected that uh, because, I mean, you, you can see it all the time on yourself, on, on, on people around you. Uh, but the fifth one is interesting. Right. I agree. It was, it was the same. And uh, it is, no matter how you think about these biases, um, having this understanding, having them, having a better insight into what might leave us, uh, lead us astray in strategic decision making would be the solution. I want to disappoint you. I need to disappoint you. Because if you think, hey, thank you. This is the sign I've been looking for. I need to watch out for these five biases. Now I'll get to training. Make sure I don't fall for them. I will be a better decision maker. I will be a better strategist. I will be a better team leader. It's not that easy. Looking at studies that evaluate the effect of training for sort of overcoming biased decision making, we see very, very mixed results. It's still a very under uh, researched field it's still something that is that is quite niche but yet we see some very yeah interesting but mixed results this one is an older one in both studies from hints 1999 they performed people with more expertise were even worse predictors of novice performance times and were resistant to debiasing techniques so the more you know the more resistance you are to debiasing Results indicate that course attendance reduced participants' overconfidence, calibration improved by 21%, but no benefit was observed for anchoring. You just simply cannot debias yourself by, by using a training, according to Welsh et al. 2007. And finally, in 2015, Ascal and others um, found that the results in their study were partly good for statistical biases, but not so for psychological biases and social biases, as we've seen in overconfidence and uh, optimism bias, as well as confirmation bias. So training itself, as the headline says, absolutely not enough. What helps then? Well, stories. Stories help. It's as simple as that. People love stories. Homo sapiens is a storytelling animal that thinks in stories rather than in graphs and believes that the universe itself works like a story. We've got heroes and villains, conflicts and resolution, climaxes and happy endings. So what we as behavioral scientists would first advise is structure your strategy as a story. It will be easier for you to comprehend. It will be easier for you to co um, communicate. It will be easier for everyone working with you to follow and get yourself into the same mindset. One element, brutally simple, and you're like, yeah, Tobin, I know this. However... Ask yourself how many times you've applied it yourself. And this is what Matej just said. The small things that make a huge impact in practice is the Whitmore model. You've probably all heard about designing smart targets. It's something we use, and I can say in every project, it's part of the defined phase 
of the drive framework. We define goals as smart goals, very specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-faced. It's also a part of the basic framework developed by um, a good friend and fellow behavioral scientists for the OECD, Pelle Hansen, also following the smart grid to say, what do we want to achieve and how does it need to be designed and created as a story to follow? Whitmore takes this to the next level and says, we also need to make sure that our goals, the, what we want to achieve is defined pure, positively stated, understood, relevant, and ethical, and ultimately very clear, challenging, legal, environmental, agreed, and recorded. Again, you feel like this is simple? It is, but that's the beauty. If it's not simple, you wouldn't pick it up. Try it out. Find your own way of, of, of working with these principles and make sure you make it a habit. You, you, you make it part of your process to create a story along at least here are the five elements of SMART whenever you define a strategy, whenever you define a goal that you would try to achieve. And now let's take this a step further. We know that training isn't sufficient. We know that stories can help. The most important element, which we're going to talk about now, that has the biggest impact is the design of your process. So the strategy for creating strategies. Or following one of my most, I think, important um, researchers and authors in the field of strategies, uh, Richard Rummel, who says, when someone says managers are decision makers, they're not talking about master strategists. A master strategist is a designer, and we need to think as behavioral designers. We need to create a process that creates a good strategy as its outcome. And not only alone, but also in teams in particular when we talk about teams. Because what we have when people sit around a table, listen to one speaker or various other opinions that are shared in the room, being it live or uh, remotely, is that the concept of groupthink comes into play. The tendency to conform to one point of view of action, which can lead to disasters. Described as a concurrent-seeking tendency interfering with effective group decision-making. And particularly pronounced in groups of high homogeneity. Whereas this wonderful picture here um, from uh, the New York cartoonist says, what can you bring to this company? Well, actually quite a lot. Let's dive into this in a little more detail and see how potentially disasters in this world, like the Bay of Pigs invasion, where JFK has sort of involved himself too much into the decision-making process leading to really, really undesirable results could have been prevented. Let's look at how the former Swiss air grounding that ultimately um, originated from the fact that the, or partly due to the fact that the team around the table was reduced down to a very homogeneous team with the same background, uh, with the same values, missing a variety of heterogeneous industry experience took a couple of very, very bad decisions in a row, ultimately leading to, leading to the grounding of what was formerly called the Flying Bank or the National Pride of Switzerland, something that is particularly hard for us here <laughs> in Zurich in Switzerland. So how do we get around this? How can we use behavioral insights to define better processes? How can we design master strategies to create better outcomes? Well, we need to make our processes sharper. Everything I'm going to talk about now is based on an article that um, Duncan Ruders and myself published recently in the HBR and the Harvard Business Review, and that summarized seven strategies for better group decision making from the behavioral sciences. And it's essentially an acronym sharper for se the seven steps, which are smaller groups work better than larger ones. Heterogeneity beats homogeneity most of the time. We're going to talk about this. The appointment of a strategic dissenter, the rating of options in an independent and anonymous way, the provision of a safe space to speak up, so the ability to have voices heard from the group, the inclusion of experts and their handling with a lot of care, and ultimately the sharing of responsibility and the collective engagement with the group process. 
So let's dive into this uh, throughout the next five to 10 minutes and see how you can use some of these strategies um, for your own decision-making process alone, or most importantly, when you work in a team. Smaller groups. It's as simple as that. Keep group sizes between three to five people when you want to make an effective decision. I'm not talking about the process of gathering information. We all know that diversity and heterogeneity is key. We all know that we need to take into account a lot of different viewpoints when we want to form uh, an opinion, when we want to evaluate different options. But when you want to take a decisions on these diff on the options, we recommend to keep this the same way uh, than buying your wedding dress or your your um, your tuxedo. You probably, I don't know, Matei, about yourself, but you probably would pick your best two or three colleagues, the people you trust, the people that know how you look good and what, in what clothes you look best to take to that place and pick the, the most nice and most beautiful um, dress for yourself and for your big day or for any other big event you have. This is, you wouldn't go into such a store with 15 people. So please don't do this when you have to take a, a tough business decision or a decision about a policy that you are following up on. We also know that, especially this is research done by Frey um, et al, groups with more than six people are much more susceptible to biases, much more susceptible to, to groupthink. And again, supporting this idea of being a smaller group of just between three to five people and a group that is naturally, you naturally pick for important decisions. Also do that, please, for your strategy meetings. Second one is heterogeneity beats homogeneity. Compose a heterogeneous teams because groups uh, with homogeneous opinions, as we just saw before in the example of, of the former Swiss Air, um, their opinions and belief tend to be more susceptible to bias and decision making just because they think along the same lines. It's pretty simple. There's one one thing where again context matters uh, as we said before for repetitive tasks re requiring convergent thinking such as in structured environments safety procedures there is there is research that says homogeneous groups perform better but in most of the cases where it's about developing new ideas going to un un uncharted territory pick a very heterogeneous team and make sure to hear all of their opinions first before taking your decision in a smaller group Appoint a strategic dissenter. Make sure there's at least one person in the room that challenges your thinking actively and critically. Make sure that if you are more than seven members, which can easily happen these days in remote meetings, you've got a lot, at least two so-called devil's advocates to divide the burden of dissenting and to make sure that the, the strategic dissenter is not isolated as a crazy person of the group, but is really hurt and is really able to do counterfactual challenges, to think along other lines, and to be really elementary in the process of making sure that the ultimate decision that is taken is also the best uh, decision that can be taken. Uh, Torben, one question. Do you, uh, sure. do you use a devil, devil, or do you appoint a devil's advocate in your project, in your decisions, effective? We did, we did, yes. I have. Uh, I would love to do so in every meeting. We should do in every meeting, but it depends on the group size. If it's larger meetings, we do, and we also want to make sure that we we ultimately go out of the meeting, try to evaluate different positions, come back in, and uh, see first of all individually, as I'm what I'm going to talk about next, uh, what we come up with and challenge each other's position before we converge into one. And if, if the situation allows, and if the meeting is big enough, have one person say, are you really sure? I don't think this is the right idea, or here is um, controversial information about this. You might want to consider this and that alternatively. So it is, it is a really tough job. It's even for us a tough job to always um, make sure it happens. But the power of it, it's, it's amazing. I and mean, it really can make a huge difference. It really can make a, a, an impact. It is important, though, that top down and from everybody in the meeting, this is an acceptable practice and it needs to be learned with what I'm saying with this is it can feel quite awkward if your best colleague who's previously talked about 
the good idea you you're sharing is suddenly challenging you from the position uh, you've not expected it before. So it has to be sort of yeah trained and learned as a habit in a meeting. But for sure, whenever the situation allows, we're we're uh, challenging ourselves with this. I think I think this is one of the greatest device and uh, and so often overestimated and, and forgotten because uh, uh, we've also started to appoint uh, a devil's advocate and also as we work on projects it usually takes several weeks sometimes several months we have in throughout the project specific instances when we call in a devil's advocate. It's usually a team member who hasn't been involved in the project from the beginning, uh, who's uh, not, you know, so uh, deep into uh, the ideas and, and the solutions that uh, the others have been working on for, uh, for hours or days before. And the sole purpose of, of this kind of call or meeting is to uh, present the devil's advocate with the ideas and for the devil to uh, pinpoint flaws and and ask uh, uh, the tough questions and uh, it, it works wonders. It's it's definitely yeah, an it amazing does. suggestion and and I well everybody should at least try it because uh, it's helped us to prevent a lot of bad decisions, a lot of uh, um, dead ends, or, or help us avoid a lot of dead ends in in client projects. Absolutely. And it's also a uh, a technique not only applicable to meetings, but also to, for example, research or writings we're doing. So we we usually send like the review process in academic publishing. We do the same. So whenever we do have a report that is ready to be published or that is going to a client, we, we usually send it to a non-involved person and ask for feedback to get their honest opinion before we disclose what our intention was. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, Turbin, we we're running out of time a little bit, so uh, um, I will I will uh, let you finish, of course, and then I'll <laughs> I'd like to ask about you know the some of the practical applications of of uh, these frameworks or of these seven rules that uh, you, you're yeah. talking about, uh, how how you've helped your clients, so uh, so our viewers have a better idea of how this can how this looks in practice. Absolutely. So I, I quickly finished this up. We just got uh, three slides to finish. Um, this is a no-brainer, actually. Gather options individually anonymously before people share and evaluate uh, thoughts in the group. Super easy in remote workers today. Just open up a shared document and uh, share information before you take it into the group. That way, you don't know who brought the idea, and you might find out that the smartest person in the room is not the highest per paid, but maybe the intern or the person that just happened to be in a meeting. Uh, provide safety. Something super simple. We, we all teach this young kids in school. We all want to make sure that there is a safe space to speak up, yet we sort of unlearn it when we get into corporate environments. So focus feedback on the proposed decision, not the person. Express comment as a suggestion, not a mandate. And make sure that you appreciate what people say. Because every, as we said before, it might be a controversial point. It might make your life harder. But ultimately, it might be the, the very important ingredient that you needed to improve the strategy you're working on. Um, last, no, second last, experts, take care. Um, Kahneman, I think, said not everybody dressed like a doctor who might have a lot of knowledge in, in uh, medical situations has also great insights into other fields. So make sure that you're not blinded by an expert look. Invite experts as informed outsiders to provide their opinion on clearly defined topics and don't trust them blindly in other areas and also make sure that the group is not blindly following the expert advice in domains where the expert might not have any expertise at all. And then last, as I said, no strategy presentation without a board of rowers, uh, mountaineers or chess players. Here we are. Um, we really think it's a key to di assign different roles to group members. And research says that um, we need to make feel each member accountable for the outcome. You can create a joint statement at the beginning. You can have people sign up uh, at the start. You need to make sure that the results of the presentation, the results of the strategy process is communicated by each of the members to not have just one person bias it and to ultimately be really a team that is taking a decision and not only a simple person. 
yeah, that's it for now on, on the seven principles and the ideas of how some of the most recent insights from behavioral science can help teams make better decisions and individuals make better decisions. Um, all up for questions. And thanks so much for being part of this presentation. So Thank far. you, Torben. Uh, thanks a lot for this. Uh, I think a, a huge amount of, of really interesting insights. And uh, um, I wanted to ask you uh, a question about the, the practical applications of, of all this. But uh, there's uh, Amy who um, did it before me because she's asking, please advise on how to write the behavior change strategy, whether it should be, whether it should include the theory of change or not. Um, and uh, uh, she's also asking to uh, uh, for you to show us or, or maybe later on send an example of a narrative written strategy. So uh, can you can you share some some concrete insights on uh, how to design or write uh, a behavior change strategy, maybe using uh, the insights that you've been talking about? Yeah, so um, I'm definitely happy to also follow up individually. So I think uh, in the meantime, uh, you kindly posted the LinkedIn profile of myself as well as Effective, also the website. So Amy, very happy to respond to your message individually beyond this webinar and take this offline uh, after the session. But uh, in short, following the sort of this this uh the flow of i just i guess just going to pick up the slide again probably to to make that easy for all of us um to to follow the whitmore model we have the idea of smart so we would like to for example see an uptake of people taking steps right now in times of COVID. many people are at home so physical movement is good for, for your psychological health. We're actually currently in a project supporting um, psychological health in, in society. And one key ingredient is physical activity outside, measured, for example, by people taking steps. We want to be, so first of all is, we just, we can't say we want people to feel psychologically healthy. We need to say, what are the ingredients of psychological health? For example, physical activity. So physical activity is already more specific. Even more specific would be to say physical activity and steps. People putting one foot in front of the other, you can do this in almost any age. You can be a toddler, you can be a retired um, person. You can take steps outside as a form of physical activity. So very specific, measurable by the amount of steps taken per person, per region, per day. Attainable being what is possible? We would like to formulate the strategy that each individual in that organization or in that in, in this part, this is like, it's a region in Switzerland, takes 500, between 500 and 1,500 steps every day because we believe that's easy for everyone to achieve outside. Just 500 meters or if we say a length of a step is 70 centimeters, 0 0.7 meters. Um, we would say this is 500 steps is less than one round on a track field. Everybody can do that. Realistic, because we give a time frame that's possible. We also give people options to do it. We've created maps, routes, which they can go to. We, we activate ideas of don't take the bus to go shopping, but walk from your place to the grocery store. This already gets you 800 steps into your account. Time bound, we give them a date and we created a challenge overall for the whole population where people can not only take the steps, but also track the steps and be part of a movement um, to achieve a certain number of steps throughout a whole cycle. For example, of, in this case, it was a weekly challenge to have a time phase clear addition. So putting this all together, we can create one narrative where we say we would like to have the group of people between 25 and 35 take steps outside between 500 and 1,000 uh, within a day um, in a group of within a day to realize that that target within the overall group, the overall population. So put it together as a strategy, presented it, activated it, and now we've, we've seen an absolutely great results and we're, we're far beyond the, the amount of steps taken. Just a small example, given the time we have, but happy to follow up, as I said, Amy. And um, I, I think you couldn't stress enough how important it is to 
properly define what we want to achieve. Because this is what we see as one of the major problems also with the, with companies we, we work with. And that's that they um, think that they have defined a problem, that they have defined uh, what they want to achieve. But when we st step in, we, we see that it's not actually really defined, you know. Um, it, it could look like uh, could look something like uh, we want to increase conversions um, for mm -hmm. this exactly. direct email, exactly. right? Well, but but that's that's by far not enough. Who do you want to convert? Um, uh, on, on which channels do you want to uh, achieve the conversions? In what time frame do you want to achieve the conversions? So uh, the number one step definitely must be clearly defining what is the behavior that we want to achieve and that we want to change. And it, it's all, it all starts there. If you don't properly define that, uh, you won't go far because uh, you might get lost. And, uh, Abs absolutely right. We had the same situation in the private organization where we, you know that, many big corporations have values and they wanted to make sure that the values are lived by all the people in the organization. And then these values are something like, we want our people to be entrepreneurial. Yeah. Okay. What does that mean? And the, the story starts, our work starts by really making sure that this entrepreneurial idea, this idea of we go to from here, from London to Moscow, we know this is our target. Moscow is the target, but then starts the, uh, the definition of how do we get there? What are the guidelines? What are the constraints? What are the abilities we have? What does entrepreneurial mean? Why do they want need to be entrepreneurial? And what is what are the motivators? What are the barriers? What are the hotspots that make people feel entrepreneurial? What are the, the elements that allow for entrepreneurship in an organization? And this can be as simple as allocating budgets to people at the right time of the year so that they can take decisions within the budget guidelines that they were given. Um, very, very simple, very small steps, again, having huge impact. Uh, and uh, Amy is following up on your answer, and she's saying, thanks, this feels like creating an intervention, not a strategy that sits across an entire organization. So how, to, how do you pull together all of the parts um, with a focus on changing behaviors? Um, so, so basically, the question is, uh, when we say strategy, we uh, might think of a strategy um, as something overarching throughout the organization, which uh, then involves specific uh, interventions, specific solutions. Um, so can you, can you clarify a little bit, how should we understand uh, a strategy, uh, a solution, and how these two work together, and how to uh, you know, design or, or think of strategies in terms of what you've been talking about? So strategy, as I said, is, is three elements. A diagnosis of the problem, sort of like a definition of the difference between current situation and future situation. So the diagnosis of the problem, something needs to change. I agree with Amy that almost any strategy in today's world where we're not limited in our abilities to have products, services, access, it's more about the uptake of that and the change of behaviors from get to current to future from a to b we need to change behaviors so it starts with a definition of what idea looks like where do we want to go a diagnosis of the barriers motivators for where we are right now and how to get there and then a set of solutions that we need to then we need to validate so for me the formulation of what i just said before was the definition phase it was the start then we can go through the next steps of the drive framework, which is ultimately the strategy from definition of where we want to go, diagnosis, identification of solutions, validation of these solutions that actually work, and then execution of the strategy overall. So getting from London to Moscow ultimately. So for us, a strategy is not only, as I said, the, the part of the definition, which we talked about just now, the part of the diagnosis, but the whole the whole set of how the interventions, how they work, and ultimately how they're executed. And it is most often the whole package that needs to be, that needs to be put in place, that needs to be put together uh, to be called a successful strategy and a successful change in behaviors, which, cannot, which often are just not one behavior, but 
various other behaviors in a set. Uh, thanks for thanks for the clarification. And there's uh, one more question um, regarding the devil's advocate. Should the uh, the person who is appointed to be the devil's advocate be known to uh, the others, or shouldn't it? Interesting question, which I personally can't answer right now on on the basis of of uh, the research. What I can certainly say. We try both, and for us, if the person is not known, had a slightly bigger effect because otherwise, the person is quickly isolated as a dissenter, and then we made this wonderful heuristic assessment of like, okay, that's that's going to be the outsider for that meeting. We're just going to ignore that person, and so we just reduce the group size by one that we no longer take into account because that person is just simply making our lives really difficult, and uh, the the strategic dissenter doesn't have the same effect. So I, from my own experience, and I'm, I'm, I assume the, the research would tell us the same, uh, not knowing who the, strate- who the devil's advocate is, at least for the whole group, is advantage, advantageous over knowing who the person will be. On the other hand, I think the life might be uh, much harder for, for the devil if uh, he or she is not known to the group. Because... Uh, uh, you know, um, she might or he might feel very uncomfortable disagreeing if others are not aware that it's hers, his job to to actually disagree. So uh, um, there are, I think, two sides of uh, of, of the coin. Uh, which one is is uh, is uh, more um, kind of more effective, and uh, which one is uh, um, actually more doable? Uh, for us, it's it's always been uh, known to the group, uh, but uh, I mean it's an interesting point to uh, try uh, not not to say who it is, uh, even though in our case it's it's usually one of our colleagues uh, because her she's very well suited for the role uh, from the way <laughs> she is a naturally born devil's advocate. Absolutely, <laughs> um, Dorben. I think we're slowly going to wrap it up. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for, for sharing your insights. And I urge you guys, um, check out Turban on LinkedIn, uh, connect with him. If you have any questions, simply reach out. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure he'll be, he'll be so open to, to talk and share ideas and, and resources with you. Definitely follow his work, both, um, as, uh, you know, as an expert and uh, as a CEO of Effective Advisory and a board member of uh, GAPS, um, which, uh, what, what does GAPS stand for, uh, Torben, for others to, uh, uh, to know? Uh, the Global Association of Applied Behavioral Scientists, the world's first nonprofit independent organization for qualified practitioners of behavioral science. Uh, just started, check out gaps.org for more information. It's a wonderful collaboration of practitioners and academics, including some of the world's biggest names in the field, Daniel Kahneman, Robert Cialdini, um, Jennifer Lerner, Dilip Soman, Pelle Hansen, Paul Dolan, many others. And um, definitely worth checking out and uh, following because we're just getting started. And there will be more events and more insights coming from this area as well. So once again, Torben, thanks a lot for being here. And uh, we'll have another webinar in a month from now, roughly. We'll announce the speaker and the topic in the coming weeks. And uh, uh, before you go, uh, let me just uh, uh, say a few more words about Inside BE. Um, if you haven't had the chance to uh, uh, go to InsideBE.com, do it now. Because as I said before, this will be the place where uh, all the behavioral um, applications in business will happen and uh, you'll be able to learn about it. So uh, um, it will all be about case studies from the brightest minds out there, how they manage to help all kinds of businesses use these insights for business success. There will be online courses, reports and guides, and the largest searchable database of uh, BE uh, interventions and solutions where you can search by um, industry category uh, keyword you name it so go to insightbe.com
www.tourbenso.com uh, to learn more. And uh, Torben, so once again, thanks a lot and uh, looking forward to catching up again very soon. Thank you, everybody, and uh, have a good evening. Thank you.